We're turning back to <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 5 for our consideration this morning. Ezekiel chapter 5. The title for the message this morning is Jerusalem's Destruction, or maybe to tie it in with chapter 4, which we entitled uh, Jerusalem's Besieging. We might call it Jerusalem's Burning. Matthew Henry notes in introducing this chapter, he says, In this chapter we have a further and no less terrible denunciation of the judgments of God which were coming with all speed and force upon the Jewish nation, which would utterly ruin it, for when God judges, he will overcome. I want to consider three thoughts or three parts to this chapter. We want to consider, first of all, its representation. Second of all, its reasons. And thirdly, its resolve. The representation of destruction, the reasons for this destruction, and the resolve of destruction. Now maybe as we were even reading this chapter this morning, <clears throat> you were thinking, well, there's not much to encourage in such a chapter as this. But there is. And one of the main points of encouragement for our souls this morning is that we worship a God who hates sin. And we worship a just God who will not let sin go unpunished. We often mourn, don't we? And we are grieved when we hear of cases in the courts where judges have let criminals off with a, a minimal sentence or somebody has committed murder or a, a heinous crime and they've got a suspended sentence. And we groan within us and we think, what is happening to our nation? That sin and crime are so lightly treated and there's no fear of God as a result because judges and the laws of our land are not a fear to evildoers. This morning we worship a God who hates sin and will deal with sin. And again, this is not just a sort of a, a, a theory. It's not just a, an idea of something to happen. But indeed it has happened. And in fact, the very context of our chapter this morning is in the context of this 70 years captivity of Jerusalem. When God brought the Babylonians on three occasions, culminating in 586 to the complete uh, desolation and destruction of Jerusalem and the captivity of its people that would last for about two generations. In fact, the word of God is given to these periods of time. We don't have, um, you know, scriptures for every period of biblical history. We have epochs. We have uh, particular periods. And the Babylonian captivity is one of those great periods of biblical history where much of the prophets are committed to writing in its context. So let's consider then this morning these three points under our main heading, Jerusalem's destruction. Notice first of all in verses 1 to 4 its representation or as we saw in the previous chapter regarding the besieging of Jerusalem and we saw um, uh, the prophet uh, you know writing on a tile and uh, putting an iron pan and setting his face against Jerusalem. Now we see another representation. We see another uh, example of this uh, destruction of Jerusalem. Notice what he is called to do. What is the prophet called to do? He's called to cut and to, to weigh and to divide his hair in verse 1. Son of man, take a, a sharp knife. Take thee a barber's razor and 
cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard. Then take thee balances to weigh and divide the hair. So this idea, this um, removal of all his hair by this barber's razor is going to be the beginning of this image of God's judgment of Jerusalem. What is he to do with the three parts? The three parts of his hair are firstly to burn a third part in the midst of the city, burn with fire in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled. In other words, when chapter 4 comes to an end, then he would burn uh, this third part of his hair in the midst of the city. Again, all very um, dramatic, uh, designed to uh, be visual, to give a visual impact to those who would consider his message. Quite often the prophets in their very image, like John the Baptist, the man was a walking message. So the way he was dressed, what he ate, was a, a message in itself. And here with the prophet Ezekiel, the, the cutting of his hair and the burning of a third part of it. And then secondly, thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife. So he was to burn a third. He was to, to cut with a knife a third. And then a third part will be scattered to the wind. And I will draw out a sword after them. So complete destruction either with fire, with cutting, or with scattering. Fourthly, he was to take uh, a few in number, and I, I think when I first read this, I thought, well, here's a, here, here's a positive point. Bind them in their skirts, in thy skirts. But then it says in verse 4, then take them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire. For thereof shall a fire come forth into all the house of Israel. It is complete decimation. It is complete destruction. John Gill notes that in uh, the 41st chapter of uh, Jeremiah, we have the fulfillment of this with the murder of Gedaliah and the events that happen afterwards in 586 uh, BC. There is really no hope in these first four verses. There is no hope, there is complete desolation signified by way of image. But then secondly, in verses 5 to 11, we have the reasons. In other words, was God being unreasonable in what God was doing to Jerusalem? Was this too harsh? Was God being uh, too judgmental? Was God being too overbearing? Well, we have three reasons why God brings about such judgment on the nation. And the first one is privilege abused. Privilege abused, verse 5. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. It's, it's almost said like an exclamation. This is Jerusalem. This is the city that I have set in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. What privilege. This city that I am by way of image showing its destruction. This very city is the city that's described in other places as the apple of his eye. This special privileged place called the city of Jerusalem. So again, John Gill notes on this, as the chief of them, in other words, chief of the nations, distinguished it from by peculiar favors and blessings, natural and spiritual, being seated in a land flowing with milk and honey, and having the house and worship of God in it. And where the symbols of his presence and his word and ordinances and therefore should have excelled them in true religion, devotion and holiness and set an example 
to them, in other words, to the other nations around. What privilege to have the dwelling of God, to have the house of God, to have the worship of God, as Paul says in Romans. What advantage then is the Jew? And he says, much in every way, for to them is committed the very oracles of God and the covenants and so on, the sacrifices. Jerusalem had it all. There was no city like Jerusalem on the face of the earth that had God's ordinances, God's covenant, and God's presence with them. And therefore, this becomes the primary reason for judgment. Because they abused, they disregarded. As the writer to the Hebrews could say, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How can a people that are so blessed? But then we remind ourselves, don't we? How quickly we forget our answered prayers. How quickly we forget our blessings. All the ways that God has blessed us. And yet we so often are like this people. We forget. And this becomes the first reason Privilege abused for their judgment. But then secondly, in verse 6, perverted actions even beyond or worse than the ungodly. Remember what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians and chapter 5 that some of the things that are done in the Corinthian church, even the ungodly, even the Gentiles would blush of what they were doing. Here it's the same with Jerusalem. It says, And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations. They've even done worse with my judgments than the nations. As one has said, it's one thing for the world to blaspheme its God. But today we have the church, the the professed church of Jesus Christ, profaning, blaspheming the name of its God, doing worse than the world. And therefore judgment comes. And my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. She's meant to be the example. She's meant to be the pinnacle of holiness. She's meant to be that which represents fellowship with God And the world is meant to look at Jerusalem and see the answer to the question, how can I know this God? And instead of that, as they looked into Jerusalem, they saw more sin than was even even in their nation. A bit like Martin Luther when he went to Rome. And he went to Rome with great excitement, expecting to see heaven on earth, expecting to see the holy city. Instead, he saw the den of iniquity that Rome was and still is. More than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments. Get this, they knew the judgments. You see, the Gentiles at least had a measure of argument in comparison They didn't have the covenants. They didn't have the judgments. But here's a nation that have the judgments and yet refuse them. And my statutes, they have not walked in them. A number of years ago, I was in the hospital back in 2015. And I was beside a Roman Catholic priest. uh, An old Roman Catholic priest in his 80s. And I said I must take the opportunity to... Uh, to converse and he was reading the Irish Times and I, I, I used that as a point of conversation I said you know I see you're a reader and, and you read I said do you you know what do you read for your devotions well first of all I don't think he knew what I meant so I had to explain what I meant by that uh, and I said do you read the, the scriptures in the New Testament or uh, you know what would you read he said no I said would you would you read Augustine? You know, I thought maybe some hope of reading a bit of Augustine. He said, no, no, he, he's too hard. So here's a man who was uh, in his 80s, a Roman Catholic priest all his life. And it became abundantly evident that the man had no fellowship 
with the Lord. And, and you're left with that question, why would a man spend all those years in religion and yet not know God? But here we have a city that had every advantage, every privilege, every uh, access to God, and yet refused his statutes, refused his judgments, and they have not walked in them. As the Lord Jesus said to the Jews of his day, you will not come to me that you might have life. You see, in chapter 5, as I've reminded you before, the will not come is John chapter 5, the cannot come is John chapter 6. The reason why people cannot come to Christ is because they don't want to. They will not come to Christ. So as Calvinists, we must be careful how we apply these doctrines. It's not that people want to come, but just somehow they, they haven't received the blessings. No, they don't want to. As Peter says, they are willingly ignorant. They don't want the truth. So privilege, abused, perverted actions beyond the ungodly. But then thirdly, a polluted sanctuary. A polluted sanctuary. Look at verse 11, skipping down to verse 11 for the moment. Wherefore as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations. It had got to the point where there was, just like the, the heathen nations, there was prostitutes, there was all sorts of uh, horrible things happening in God's house. And the priests were engaging in all sorts of horrific sin. And these are detestable in the sight of God. The Lord says, I will be magnified, I will be made holy, I will be regarded as holy by all those who come into my house. Brothers and sisters, we have a challenge. But the challenge is simple and yet the application is much more difficult to understand. We must be holy. But it's not about me becoming a more religious person. We had this conversation last week. You see, many people see the problem and then go about being religious. That's not the answer. The answer is about having such fellowship with our God that we become like him. Such fellowship with our Savior. Loving the Savior. Loving our God. So that instead of being detestable, we will be the desired people of his heart. Therefore will I diminish thee. Neither shall mine eye spare. Neither will I have any pity. And this is again why the Lord Jesus was so harsh on the religious leaders of his day. They had a special sin. They had a special responsibility. And they failed in the very areas that they were called to perform. And again, this applies very in, in the context of Ezekiel because we know that Ezekiel himself was a priest. He was the son of Buzai, the priest. And therefore he himself was a priest. So therefore he's a priest talking to other priests with the authority of God. But the scripture reminds us that we are a royal priesthood. We are to be those spiritual priests, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, holy and without blemish before our God. So then we have in this point, because they've abused their privileges, because they have acted per perversely beyond the ungodly, because they have polluted the sanctuary, verse 11. Therefore, in verses 7 to 10, there is pronounced judgment. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. And again, it's the, thus saith the Lord. It repeats again and again, doesn't it? it is, this is not Ezekiel saying it. This is not Ezekiel's words. And, you know, as we preach the word of God, it's not what we're saying. This is what God is saying. This is God's word. This is God's mind. This is God's pronouncement. Because ye have multiplied. Again, it goes back to the reasons. Because ye have multiplied 
more than the nations that are round about you, and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations, that are, you haven't even done as good as them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, this is personal, uh, as one of our friends in the city often does when he's, when he's preaching in the gospel, he says, Take it personally. You know, we often say, don't we, today, uh, I'm not being personal. Here, God is being personal. He says, Behold, I, even I, am against thee. This is a personal problem between God and the people. And it's not just vain words. It's not sometimes as we as parents might say to our children, Now, Johnny, if you do that one more time, I am going to such and such. Now God says, and will, verse 8, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee, in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like. This is going to be so serious because of all thine abominations. The responsibility is with them. The horrific verse, verse 10 where there will be a mutual consuming between the fathers and the sons. They will, as is often the case with the enemies of God in the Old Testament, God in his judgment makes them become the instruments of judgment upon each other. And we see that in the world, don't we? That's the teaching of Revelation 17 with, uh, and Revelation 17 and 18 and with, with those who are the enemy of, of the Lamb and those who are the enemy of God's people. It says that they fight with each other, they war with each other, and they consume each other. And that's why the scripture says, judgment is mine, it is mine to avenge. We are not to avenge, we are not to pay. That is God's uh, uh, prerogative, that is God's work. And therefore we leave it in God's hands. The reasons for destruction. And then thirdly and lastly, the resolve, the resolve of judgment. Verses 12 to 17. Notice briefly six aspects to this resolve. There is in verse 12 fulfilled judgment. The fulfillment, verse 12, of verses 1 to 4. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence. And with the famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee. And a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds. And I will draw out a sword after them. As just as Ezekiel had effectually cut off his hair. And burnt it and scattered it and so on. God himself was going to do that work to the city. This was to be be fulfilled judgment but secondly we have fury satisfied from god's perspective verse 13 the first part of the verse thus shall mine anger be accomplished and i will cause my fury to rest upon them and i will be comforted notice this is all about the lord it's about his comfort it's about his fury being satisfied This is the righteous judgment of God against rebellious sinners. This is not people who are trying their best. Brothers and sisters, let me comfort you here this morning. If you are genuinely seeking to honor God, and genuinely seeking, yes, you fail. Yes, you fail daily as I fail. But as Peter could say, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. If with any measure of your heart you can say, yes, maybe, maybe with great uh, red-facedness, maybe with embarrassment, but you can say to some degree, Lord, I do love thee. I, I don't love thee as I should. I don't obey thee as I should, but I want to. I desire to. I long to. This is not the people that are being addressed here. The scripture says that God does not quench a smoking flax Uh, A bruised reed he will not break. If you are a a believer and you fail daily, that's not who's been talked about here. These are people who have no time for God, no desire for God, and all their religious practice is abomination in the sight of God. 
So when the Lord Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount that our, our righteousness must, ex- must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he, he's not saying that we're saved by our good works. He's saying that the kind of righteousness they have is wickedness and evil in God's sight. It's hypocrisy and abomination. And we rejoice with God. As Revelation 19 verses 1 to 6 tells us that on the day of judgment when when the hypocrites, when those who despise God, despise his judgment and despise his gospel, when they stand before God and God exercises his judgment on them, we will be comforted in him and with him and we will rejoice. Being religious not only cannot save you, but it is an abomination in the sight of God, outside of grace, outside of the gospel. Because really what it is, is you telling God, actually, I'm good enough myself. And I don't really need God. I'm good enough as I am. We often get that reaction on the, on the streets of Dublin. You know, people say, and I'm trying to think of a really good answer. So if you can think of a really good answer to this one. Someone passes by, we're handing a gospel of John along with a tract from the church. Uh, and we'll say, we always make a point of saying, you know, the gospel of Christ, so they know exactly what they're getting. So it's not like, you know, is this some booklet about, you know, uh, selling windows to me or something. They know exactly what they're receiving. And when people hear that, they'll say, no, I'm okay, thank you. And I'm thinking, I need to have a really good answer to that. So think about, there's your homework for this week, and text me some answers. What's the answer to that? When you say the gospel of Christ and someone says, no, I'm okay, thank you. What are they saying? Thirdly, fury realized from the people's perspective. The second half of verse 13. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal. When, they'll, now get this, when will they know it? When I have accomplished my fury in them. You see, there's a day coming when people will realize, but it'll be too late. In this world, to know God is to know everlasting life, to know eternal life. There's a day coming for people when they will only realize, when they will only know that God is serious, that God is real, when they face him in judgment. Of course, everybody actually believes as a God. There's no such thing, let's be clear about this, there's no such thing as a genuine atheist. It doesn't matter, and I often say again in in, in evangelism, I say, really, I don't care what you say, because I believe what God says. And in Romans chapter 2, it says that God's law is written in your conscience. And you notice a God, and you notice a judgment, and it really doesn't matter what you say to me. I used to waste a lot of time with atheists debating the existence of God. We need to stop debating the existence of God with atheists. We just need to state it. As Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God, full stop, created the heaven and the earth. They know there's a God. They know there's a judgment. They just choose to ignore him. Fourthly, shame in the sight of the nations. Verses 14 and 15. This corresponds to the earlier verse where they had shamed God in the sight of the nations. Now they will be shamed in the sight of the nations. This is perfect judgment, isn't it? Moreover, I will make thee waste a reproach among the nations that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. In other words, you by your actions thought you would bring shame upon me. No, it will be you that the shame, the shame, uh, if I can use this. Um, human proverb he who laughs last laughs the longest so shall it be a reproach and a taunt verse 15 an instruction and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee and, and notice here it's in thee it's not about thee it's in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes I the Lord have spoken it. Now, here's another important principle. When we, we talk about the fury of God, the anger of God, 
we're not to think of it like us. You know, so again, going back maybe to uh, sometimes our relationship with, as parents with our children. You know, we, we ask our child to do something and they don't do it. We ask them again and, and it, sort of, it, it sort of boils up in us. And then we explode and we, we start shouting or whatever it is and then we feel bad afterwards. That's not the fury of God. God's fury is always at the same level. Back in the Psalms it says that, that God is angry with the wicked every day. It's never that it boils up and you know, God is, is holding himself back and then finally, you know, at the day of judgment he just explodes. That's not the anger and fury of God. It's perfectly controlled. It's, it's, it's perfectly wise. It's perfectly good. On Judgment Day, we won't see a God that is, has lost control and is just casting everybody into the lake of fire. That's not the picture we're to have. In fact, the only people that will be out of control are those who have rejected God. He will be perfectly holy in his righteous indignation. Perfectly calm and perfectly just. You never see a, a judge, well I've never seen at least, not that I've seen too many judges in my life thankfully, <laughs> but you don't see judges up on the, on the bench losing control. In fact if they were they would, they would diminish from their position, wouldn't they? Or a, a policeman maybe who, who stops you, uh, the sweat might be coming down your brow, but he's perfectly calm as he's riding out to you, you know, you went 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, He's perfectly calm about it. And you're going, oh. The day of judgment, God will be perfectly righteous, holy, and sovereign in his judgment. Fifthly, famine sent and the staff broken. Remember we mentioned last week in chapter 4, the staff of bread. Well, it's mentioned again. This thing that they put their trust in, their provisions, their possessions will be broken by famine. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. I will break this staff that you rest upon, that you rely upon, by, by this famine. And then lastly, a full outpouring of God's justice, verse 17. So I will send upon you famine and evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now, brothers and sisters, as I conclude here, and I have one or two more things to say as we conclude. The first thing is about application. Somebody said to me last week that in their church, um, one of their preachers stands up and he preaches a message like this and then just turns it on the congregation and says, oh, you're just all the same. Thank God, my conviction is you're not. In fact, there's nobody I could look down upon now. Not, now, don't take this, this, <laughs> I don't know your heart. But in my judgment, I rejoice that I'm not dealing with a church of people, a congregation of people who are trying to rest on their own self-righteousness and have no time for God. We rejoice at that. We are, we are glad that we love the Lord. So I'm not going to apply this. But there is, of course, always the need to get rid of hypocrisies and so on. We might not be hypocrites in that positional sense, but in practice we can be. But let me also apply this in a gospel sense. We have here the idea of the people bearing their sin. It says, the, and in verse 17, it says, I will send upon you. Notice, and I want to change verse 17. I want to change the words. And I want to apply them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we should bear this judgment in ourselves. We should, because of our sin, bear this judgment. But listen as I change the words and apply them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So I, that is the Father, says, I will send upon him, that is Christ, famine and evil beasts. 
and they shall bereave him. And, pe and pestilence and blood shall pass through him. And so I will bring the sword upon him. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Nothing less than God doing all this to the soul of Jesus Christ is necessary for our salvation. Nothing less than that. Christ had to bear all our sins. Christ had to bear all our bereavement, all our famine, all our wickedness, all our hypocrisy. Christ himself had to bear all of that in his own body on the tree. Christ, in that day, bore all the punishment that, the, that your sin requires and deserves. As Isaiah could say it this way, surely he has carried our sorrows. Surely he has carried our sorrows. As we go to the Lord's table this morning, we are coming to the one who has carried our sorrows and has carried us in his arms to glory. Amen. Amen. Let us sing from Psalm 124. Before we go to the Lord's table, Psalm 124, second version, page 268. Page 268. Now Israel may say, and that truly, it's wonderful words to sing after what we've heard. If that the Lord had not our cause maintained, if the Lord had not sustained our right when cruel men against us furiously rose up in wrath. In other words, except the Lord had intervened, we would have been swallowed. And the Lord intervened even between us and his own righteous judgment. And therefore we can say in verse 6, But blessed be God, who doth us safely keep, and hath not given us for a living prey unto their teeth and bloody cruelty. Psalm 124 will remain seated to sing. Actually, no, we'll stand. Let's stand to sing, uh, and then we'll briefly pray as we go to the Lord's table. Now Israel may say, and that 
lifted frame. Father in heaven, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we rejoice that we have not been left to the just consequences of our sin, to its bondage, to its shame, to its destruction. But the God who was rich in mercy, for the great love wherewith he loved us, has drawn us by the cords of his love in Jesus Christ our Lord, and has not given us as a living prey to the enemy, but is the God of our salvation, the God of our deliverance. Lord, bless us now as we turn to the table of communion. Bless our souls. Grant us rejoicing hearts in Jesus' name.